I'm Dr. Eric Claville, and this is the Claville Report, Law, Policy, and Politics. In 2008, our country witnessed one of the most life-changing events that we've ever seen, not just in the United States, but also that changed the world. And that's the election of the first Black president of the United States, former President Barack Obama. And then in 2012, we also saw a major milestone in our country, and that's the re-election of the first Black president of the United States. During those time periods, voter participation increased exponentially each election cycle. Of course, we saw it drop off in 2016. But in 2020, once again, we hit record numbers of voters going to the polls to vote. It is my belief that when we have people participating in the democratic process, democracy works. But it wasn't always like this in the United States of America. For hundreds of years, everyone except white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males were forbidden by law to vote. As a matter of fact, if you tried to vote, if you tried to educate those to vote, your life was in danger. And even some gave their lives and others, their lives were taken. We see now in 2021 that there are many challenges to the right to vote. There are many challenges to ensuring that our democracy is as participatory as possible. There are many challenges to limit the right to vote of lawful citizens. We'll take a look at a tale of two Southern states and see exactly what these two states are doing in 2021, when both, prior to 1965, limited the rights of Black people to vote. In other words, they were disenfranchised. But let's take a look at the history from then to now for the New York Times short clip. In this scene from the 2012 movie, Abraham Lincoln spells out the terms of Reconstruction. All they heard was the first time any president has ever made mention of Negro voting. In 1865, he said freed slaves who were intelligent or had served as soldiers should be allowed to vote. The 14th Amendment, passed in 1868, guaranteed this right as part of the full citizenship accorded to African-American men. But for much of the 20th century, voting remained a contentious issue. The 19th Amendment, ratified in 1920, gave women the right to vote, but the racial divide remained. Some states continued to limit voting, either through measures like the poll tax or direct intimidation of African-American voters. In the South, there were even whites-only primaries. This is Sam Tannenhaus of the New York Times. The first modern Civil Rights Act was signed by President Eisenhower in 1957. It created a federal commission authorized to enforce voting rights. Senator Strom Thurmond conducted the longest filibuster in history, more than 24 hours, in an effort to thwart the bill. But it passed. The location for the meeting with Senator Ribicoff. Still, voting was not equal for all. Massive resistance in the Deep South was organized to keep blacks from the polls, and legal enforcement was hampered by all white juries. Voting rights became a central issue in the civil rights movement. I think this march will go down as one of the greatest. In 1965, uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led the march from Selma to Montgomery for better voting laws. The nation was shocked by images of the marchers being attacked. And less than five months later, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It barred states and districts from curtailing the vote on the basis of race, color, or language. It is wrong 
deadly wrong to deny any of your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. Sections four and five of the bill included special provisions to ensure fair voting practices in a number of states, most of them in the South. Voting rights advocates say some citizens there continue to be disenfranchised. But the Supreme Court's close ruling on Tuesday, striking down Section 4, suggests the conditions have changed since 1965, and it is left to Congress to reconsider the act. As you can see, we just didn't get here overnight. As you can see, the fight against persons being able to lawfully vote without being intimidated, without being killed, without being disenfranchised, is a right that we fought for in this country for hundreds of years. But the fight is still today. But let's take a look at the 1965 Civil Rights Act before we talk about the tale of two Southern states. Now, before the 1965 Civil Rights Act, we know that, and this is before the Civil War, African Americans, known as slaves at that time, were not allowed to vote. Not only were they disenfranchised from being able to vote, they were disenfranchised from being able to be educated, disenfranchised from owning property, and disenfranchised from owning their own freedom. For 247 years before the end of the U.S. Civil War of 1865, this was the life of millions of Americans who worked and toiled the soil and built this country from their sweat, their tears, their blood, their labor, and even their own lives. 247 years. But after the U.S. Civil War and the North won the battle in 1865 and the South surrendered, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were signed, of course, to abolish slavery, to provide citizenship uh, to newly free slaves, and the right to allow slave, former slaves, now citizens, African Americans, the right to vote, and more specifically, Black males. But after Reconstruction, only three years after 1865, we're talking 1868, 1869, 1870, any gains that African Americans made in those Southern states in order to vote, in order to exercise their free rights, were starting to be turned back at an alarming rate. This is an era that we, we were known as Jim Crow and segregation, legalized sex segregation. So once again, Newly freed slaves, now African-American citizens, are once again being disenfranchised through intimidation, through unfair practices, through unfair challenges to their citizenship and their ability to read and write, and just foolishness, such as, guess how many jelly beans in a jelly jar? <laughs> also, a poll tax, which was also eliminated by an amendment of the U.S. Constitution as well. The literacy test, being able to read a certain document, also a test in order to know what's in the Constitution, a constitutional test, and the grandfather clause. All of these requirements were placed upon African Americans just to cast their vote. Just to cast their vote, just to exercise their God-given rights and rights allowed by the law. I want that to sink in for a moment because you have to ask yourself, why would a society, why would people, why would individuals fight so hard against another group of individuals, another group of people, not to exercise only one of their rights, and that's the right to vote? Only thing you're doing is casting a ballot, pressing a button, checking a box, bubbling in a circle, and dropping it into a box to allow it to be counted. That's it. But you have to ask yourself, if you fight so hard, so hard against me having that right and exercising that right, 
How important is that right? Well, it's very important. You see, the late John Lewis stated, and he believed, that the right to vote was the most powerful nonviolent weapon that we as citizens in our country have in America. And he was exactly right. Simply by casting a vote for the candidate of your choice, casting a vote for or against a law, casting your vote for or against an amendment, casting your vote, making your voice heard, will now start to dictate and control people, beliefs, and resources. It'll start to let individuals in society know what is and is not acceptable. It will start to allow communities and people who have been historically discriminated against start to have laws turned back and resources allocated to them so that they too can have an opportunity to live the American dream. That is the power of the vote. That power of the vote is the same power that banded together, we as a country were able to elect the first black president of these United States. Notice I said first, and also the first black woman vice president of these United States. That's the power of the vote. That's the power that those that seek to stop understand that we have. So through poll taxes, grandfather clauses, literacy tests, intimidation, and even death, these were the tactics from 1868 until roughly 1865 that were being executed on a daily and yearly basis, annual basis, to stop Blacks from voting. But during the civil rights era, the modern civil rights era, as we know it today, and we call it today, there's one piece of legislation that was passed which erased all of, and when I say erased, there, it was still on the books, but it erased the ability without penalty for individuals to suppress or discriminate against those with the right to vote. And that was the 1965 Voting Rights Act. What did it do? It outlawed discriminatory practices against voting that were adopted in many Southern states after the Civil War. And we've talked about many of these tactics that they utilized, such as poll tax, grandfather clause, literacy tests, um, also guessing the amount of jelly beans in a jar. In essence, this particular act enforced the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, an amendment that was signed almost 100 years after the signing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. It took almost 100 years to provide the teeth, the enforcement to our society. to protect people who built this country, to protect individuals who love this country, to protect families that were born in this country, to protect our constitution and the ideas of democracy and equality. Almost 100 years. Again, understand the value of your vote. Understand the value and power that a collective group of people have when they put their votes together around one idea, around one candidate in order to represent them in legislative bodies. Yes, I agree with the late John Lewis. The vote is our most powerful nonviolent weapon that we have in our democracy. We must use it we must use it wisely, we must use it often, and we must protect it. Now, that's the history behind the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And in that Voting Rights Act of 1965, there were various provisions that were placed in it to help protect against 
encroachment upon disenfranch upon individuals that were disenfranchised before. Part of that was Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, pre-clearance. That meant that any southern state that historically discriminated against or disenfranchised African-American voters had to have their plans for voting, changing voting districts, changing voting laws, pre-cleared by the U.S. Department of Justice. Well, Shelby County versus Holder eliminated or really gutted that part of the Constitu of the Voting Rights Act itself. Now, what did that do? That allowed Southern states and other states to start enacting provisions that would hurt and harm African Americans, the same people who were disenfranchised for 247 years of slavery, the same people who were disenfranchised and terrorized for one, almost 100 years after the Civil War and, the, and, and Reconstruction. Limit the power of vote to the same people that benefited from the 1965 Voting Rights Act. By one decision of the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court, that provision was made moot, ineffective, and almost repeated the mistakes of the past. In part, one state, North Carolina, the Federal Circuit Court, the Fourth Circuit, ruled that what they tried to do were surgically intended to hurt and harm and disenfranchise African Americans. In other words, it just didn't happen haphazard. There was intent, there was reason behind it, and the reason was devastating to African Americans. There was no good behind it. So the federal court overturned what that law tried to do in North Carolina. But it's 2021. You would think that these various legislators and these states have learned their lesson. Well, you would be mistaken. Voting rights, 2021, a tale of two Southern states. Where are we now? Let's take a look at the state of Georgia and the state of Virginia or the Commonwealth of Virginia. The state of Georgia is known by a very recent history its emergence as the capital of the South, as a major state, more specifically through the city of Atlanta and its growing suburbs, a city of great economic power and boom and influence, both in sports, entertainment, also in education, and many other areas of our society. In other words, it's a major city in the United States and in the world. So you would think a, a city like this that's progressive, that's inclusive, a city within a state, they would recognize the value of being inclusive and not exclusive. In 2020, this is the same state that elected two U.S. senators, one that was African-American, pastor, that graduated from the historically black college and university, Morehouse College, the alma mater of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and many, many others, and also a Jewish American. This is the state of Georgia. It's also the state where a young, ambitious legislator believed that she could change the world by registering people to vote. And she pushed and she pushed and she pushed and or helped to organize with many others collaborate and with many other efforts. But she pushed and registered individuals to vote that had never voted before. And single-handedly almost, this state all rewrote history. It was this state was one of the major Southern states of the Confederacy that voted in the modern times for a Democratic president. Absolutely amazing, astonishing. So you would think 
that the legislators and the people of this state would say this is the new normal. This is the key to success. Include, don't exclude. You would think that individual with business prowess and the intellect that comes out of that area, that state, that city, would come to reason to say this is the new model. But you would be wrong. As a matter of fact, almost immediately after the 2020 election, you had over 40 states pre-file over 250 bills limiting the access to the ballot or the right to vote. Georgia was one of them. But Georgia went a step further. Not only were the bills pre-filed, they were passed and signed into law by Governor Kemp. Some of the provisions in this GOP back measure, it drastically limited what we call drop boxes. That's where individuals can take their ballots, fill them out, and drop them in a box, very similar to how we drop letters in the mailbox, U.S. Postal Service. They limited those boxes. It was made for ease and access. We've done this for hundreds of years. We've carried mail from one neighborhood to the next, to the next state, even overseas. You would think it would be almost common sense that this would be good policy to have drop boxes. But the legislators, the GOB-backed legislators in Georgia said no. Also, it required proof of identity for absentee voting. Once again, you can't absentee vote unless you're on the voting rolls. You can't receive a ballot in the mail unless you're on the voting rolls. Maybe they believe that this will stop some type of fraud that did not exist in the 2020 election, according to the Republican Secretary of State for Georgia, where he contended with his own president, President, former President Donald Trump, that there was no fraud, even though the president said it was. So therefore, the requirements of these voting restrictions fly in the face of reason and logic based upon what took place only three months ago. But it goes a, bit, a step further. It goes to the point of being ridiculous and petty. But it makes it a crime. Some of the legislature that was signed makes it a crime to provide food or water to voters that are lining up at polling locations. Now, on that one, I must say how evil, how blatant, blatantly restrictive of helping individuals to vote Restricting individuals to vote can you be? It makes no sense. Food or water. When you limit polling locations, when you limit the opportunity to have access to the ballot box, when you limit the ability to cast your vote in the most convenient, accessible, and legal way as possible, you're going to force longer lines at polling stations. And without the ability to have food or water if you didn't anticipate a wait in line for hours, you'll go to jail. At what point do does a man go to jail for helping another fellow man with food or water? Not enticing them to vote for you because they've already made up their mind who they're going to vote for. But it makes, makes it illegal. The question is, what's next? Well, there have been federal lawsuits filed against these intentional discriminatory laws without evidence that they're needed to stop any type of fraud and is only needed to stop individuals from voting for the other side. So we'll see what happens with the federal court. But that's Georgia. 
in 2021. So let's look at another Southern state, the Commonwealth of Virginia, also called the former capital of Confederacy, also the Midwest, the Mid-South. Just this a few days ago, Governor Ralph Northam, a Democrat, signed the Voter Rights Act of Virginia, making the Commonwealth of Virginia the first state in the nation, not the South, not the East, not the Southeast, not the North, not the West or the Midwest, but the first state in the nation to enact its own Voting Rights Act. What it does, it doesn't limit your right to vote or participate in the democratic process, but it protects your right to vote and participate in a democratic process. As a matter of fact, when the Commonwealth of Virginia and its Democratic-led legislature and Democratic governor and lieutenant governor believe that when voting rights are being attacked across the country, with no better example than North Carolina, as I mentioned, in the state of Georgia. Virginia is, is expanding the access to the ballot box. As Governor Northam said, expanding it, not restricting it. In addition to that, it protects against voter suppression, voter discrimination, and voter intimidation. Some of these very important measures allow for the protection of African-Americans who in the Commonwealth of Virginia suffered just as much as any other African-Americans in any other state to exercise their right to vote. I would say this is an, this act honors the sacrifices of these African-Americans and allies in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So in a time period where one Southern state is restricting, another is expanding, where another Southern state is making it a crime to assist, another Southern state is making it, making it an incentive to expand democracy. Democracy itself is the most tenuous governmental, tenuous form of government in our world. And that's because you have many factions fighting for the power of one. One seat, one governorship, one term to be able to dictate and control the laws, the policy in which our nation, our state, and our cities govern its individuals. That is the power of the vote. But also not just in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but in a federal court in Virginia, in Virginia Beach, the court federal judge ruled that Virginia Beach's at-large local election for the city council was illegal. And it ordered them to go back and ensure that their new voting scheme is in line with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Ironically, the city of Norfolk, which is the neighboring city of Virginia Beach in the Commonwealth of Virginia, also had a lawsuit filed against its at-large system in the 1980s and was challenged and won and therefore, individuals are voting by wards or districts in which they live. The Virginia Beach is that large district system. That means that every single member, citizen of Virginia Beach can vote for the city council members. That means if you live in the North Virginia Beach and there's someone that lives in district that is south of you, you can vote and tell those individuals in District 3 who they should have representing them, and vice versa. As a matter of fact, there are several seats where you don't even have, you, you're elected and don't have to live specifically 
in any district, but you can serve on the city council. Now is illegal. Maybe the federal court in Georgia will cite this particular case in Virginia. We'll see. But the right to vote has been fought for. Blood has been shed. Many lives have been lost. Many laws have been passed to restrict, to disenfranchise, and to fight against the restrictions, the discrimination, and disenfranchisement. Today, we have an example of a state that historically discriminated against African Americans of what not to do when trying to build an inclusive society. And we also have an example of a state that not only historically disenfranchised against African Americans' right to vote, but also was the capital of the very symbol of division in our country called the Confederacy. But it has turned the corner in 2021 and it's changed the laws to say that inclusiveness is the best business model, not being exclusive. Just as our ancestors did, just as our fellow citizens continue to do, we must continue to fight the good fight. We must continue to press toward the mark of ensuring that our democracy works for everyone by ensuring that the ballot and access to the ballot is given for every citizen of the country that is able to vote under the laws of this nation. Because until democracy is free for everyone to participate, we are not free. Protect the right to vote. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have in our democracy. It's precious. It's been bought with a price. And it, it is our responsibility to guard it, to protect it, and to pass it down to the next generation. Thank you for listening to this Clavier Report, Law, Policy, and Politics. We'll see you next time.